You're listening to the greatest multifamily investment advice show. My name is Adam Ross, and now I'm talking everything multifamily for an in-depth conversation, and I will be diving deep into raising capital, deals, and underwriting process. Welcome back to the greatest multifamily advice show. Today we have Zoria Plange, our guest and real estate investor out of Edmond region. From engineering to successful transition into multifamily, raising capital, and all sorts of fun. How are you doing, Surya? I'm doing great. How are you, Adam? Thanks so much for being with us today. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. Like, I think I, I may be the first uh, female guest, so I'm really yeah, happy correct. to uh, to be on here because I'm trying to change the look of uh, real estate investing, and <laughs> it's a pretty male dominated area especially in multifamily so I'm glad, to, glad to be here yeah one of the first on i think on alberta in you have, alberta yeah okay. yeah i think you have your own uh, group already meetups on alberta i think most of them is females you're trying to have this kind of uh, transition i think yeah well i'm trying to um, get more women into real estate investing. As I said, it's pretty male dominated and it can be pretty intimidating for someone if they want to get into real estate investing, um, where they see all these groups that are all made up of guys. And um, so, yeah, so we have, we have a invest her meetup chapter in Edmonton, and it's actually part of a wider network of meetups. There's about 55 different chapters hmm. all over, mostly in the U S and this is the second one in Canada. So it's a way to help and um, inspire and promote, um, just help people, women invest in real estate. Yeah, yeah. I would like yeah. to start with beginning. What was the motivation and when you started? Like, what was the motivation to, I think everyone has started with this phase as flipping and single family and potentially multifamily. But what was, what was the motivation to do this transition from engineering to mom? to be a great mom with also business? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I guess it all started um, from the beginning. Like I grew up in Edmonton, a very pretty normal life. You know, I was taught to go to school and do well and then, and then go get a job and you know, go to university. So that's what I did. And, um, and so I kind of went into engineering because um, you know, I was good at it and I knew that I could probably get a good job afterwards. Um, I don't think I was like that passionate about it. Um, I just knew that, you know, I could probably do well. And yeah, and so out of engineering, the focus was always, yeah, to get a job. And, you know, I focused on that. And um, my husband as well, we met in university. And so we both went through that together. Um, yeah, and then out of university, we were a few years into our careers. Like the focus was always to get our PN mm. designation. Mm. And then, um, yeah, we kind of did, did everything we were supposed to do. We got a, you know, got our first place, got married. And and then we were at this point, we're like, okay, well, that's all done. We've got our PNG, we got married, we got our first property. Um, what now? And I think most people then they just start having kids. Like that's the next step that you're supposed to do in life, right? Um, we weren't quite ready for that. Um, so we were starting to, we were more kind of focused on our careers. Um, but we were thinking like, okay, now that we've kind of hit this milestone of getting our PN, um, do we just like work now for the next 40 years? And, and then just like hope that we're gonna have a decent enough pension at the end and you know, the government's gonna take care of us in retirement. Um, like that part just didn't sound like a good plan for us. <laughs> like, um, so that's when we really actually finally had the time to read and um, think about investments and um, think about our future. <laughs> Um, so we started reading a lot of books, um, a few listening to books, mm -hmm. and that's um, when we first, and then one of the books for many, it was like a version of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was a retire, rich, retire, young book mm -hmm. that we had listened to. Um, and so we had a lot of other books that we were listening to as well. But that one, I think, was the main one that gave us that idea that, um that there's another way that this idea of real estate investing, because I had never really understood that before. Um, I had never been a renter even. I just went from my parents' house straight to purchasing a condo. And um, I just I didn't understand like how you could possibly have that as a business. Um, so, but that really opened up my eyes. And then I would like remember thinking to myself like, are there really 
you know, successful investors in Edmonton. I wonder if people do this in Edmonton. Like, is this a thing? <laughs> like, I had no idea. Hmm. Um, but yeah, as I researched it a bit more, I fell, um, I come, came across the real estate investment network and I just like opened up my eyes, like there's this whole new world, like all these people who invest in real estate in Edmonton. And it was like amazing to meet so many people. Um, and so that's how we really got started just getting educated through that group. Um, and then really like a few months later, we bought the first two properties and then when was uh, that? Six months later. This was in end of 2013. So it's oh, okay, long time been back. Over over eight years ago now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you started with a small, uh, uh, single family home for how long? Yeah. The sing- we, yeah first ones were two like single family homes or half duplexes, and so we yeah started with that, and then we decided to focus on um, growing our portfolio and. No worries. Um, yeah, we said um, we wanted to focus on growing our portfolio rather than like learning how to be a landlord because mm. we were kind of limited on our time. And so, yeah, we were then focused on joint ventures. And so we got yeah two properties on our own, but we were, you know, we were maxed out, maxed out of our own money. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, we started to get into joint ventures. Someone keeps calling me. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, we serviced residential. Probably we had about um, seven doors, and that was over the course of like we kind of slowly did that over the course of like five years. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't until um, I went through this big transition of um, having kids and quitting my engineering job. Like, like my whole life <laughs> changed. I was before like a mostly engineer, a Ukrainian dancer, totally stopped that, became a mom and then focused full time on real estate. And that's when I really had a lot more time and um, we were able to kind of look at other, uh, like as this larger projects. And that's also at the same time that you know, the stuff we had already just wasn't working so well. Like the single family homes just weren't cash flowing very well. Like We've been in a recession for the last six years and it's been pretty tough. Um, those properties that we bought in 2013 and 2014 were like cash flowing $400 a month, which was great. But then uh, when no oil went down, no appreciation, but the cash flow was good. Hmm. Um, but then when rents went down um, and they just stayed down there, they went down $400. So then we had all these properties that were just break even. Um, at least we didn't have to feed any of them like we didn't have to they weren't negative cash flow Mm. but um yeah so they just weren't working very well like we wanted cash flow so that's why we started looking into more um multiple unit properties multifamily. Mm. um we were also like maxed out on mortgages our joint venture partners didn't want to qualify for mortgages anymore either so all of that it just made a lot of sense to just now get into multifamily. Yeah. yeah yeah so what is your target market right now and criteria about multifamily? Like you're focusing on 10, 20, 50 unit buildings. So what is your actual, I think you're focusing more in, in Alberta market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, overall we focus on landlord friendly locations, okay. um, multifamily, smaller multifamily for now, we are getting to larger projects. Um, but um, yeah, landlord friendly locations, family friendly rentals and on the newer build side, like all of, even our initial residential properties were all like less than 10 years old when we bought them. Hmm. Um, and then over the last five years, I've been focused on pre-construction, new build properties. So um, what was the upside about uh, focusing? Because this is a different approach here. Uh, focusing mm-hmm. on uh, the pre-construction side, you're buying and hold, correct? You're buying yeah, buy and not selling. Yeah, okay, I've only so- sold. We're in the process of selling our first (laughs) property. So what was the actual upside about regular buy and hold and adding value to the actual your strategy, which is uh, the pre-construction and then hold? Like from the financing financial uh, point of view with the lenders, did you find it's Mm -hmm. like more appealing for the lenders to focus on the pre-construction? What was the motivation for you to focus on the pre-construction? 
Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I think financing was a big part of it. Um, like I, I was kind of like everyone else. I, I really do like the add value strategy. And um, so that's the direction I was going in initially. We were looking at a lot of older buildings. We put offers a lot, on a lot of stuff, but then we ended up walking away because it was just such poor condition. And um, so, yeah, I was going down that route because that it makes a lot of sense when you buy the right property. Um, but then my realtor came to me with this um, pre-construction sixplex. Um, and it just made a lot of sense. Um, it actually is three residential properties, but because um, there's six units in total, I could put commercial financing on it. And that was like my main reason for going into multifamily is go getting into commercial financing. Which is so about I, five units. Anything above, above five units is exactly. actual commercial lending. Yeah. Not residential anymore, correct? Yeah, so I saw it as a, almost like an easy way into multifamily. Like this is, I could use commercial financing, um, everything else about it was really no different than what I had done before. Like it was fit into my portfolio with the rest of my properties. I could keep my same property manager. Um, it's the same area as my other residential properties. Um, so, and it just, and, but I could put commercial financing on it. So it was this, the sweet spot that I found. <laughs> so um, what was the loan to value to this? How much was the, uh, the total price? This six bucks, uh, 1.35 million is what we paid for that long time and back was that long time back uh no well we got that price in 2019 19 okay 1.35 yeah, so. and uh, what was the uh, ltv loan to value we initially got um we had to close with bridge financing but then we refinanced with cmhc and got 85 percent after after uh, finalizing the project correct yeah like after it was fully tenanted yeah, and stabilized, yeah. then we refinanced it with CMHC hmm. and um, and got 85%. That's good. That's good. And how yeah. long was the bridging financing was? Uh, it ended up taking six months. Good. So yeah. you, your actual agreement with the developer was only six months to deliver the six units to you, correct? From Oh, no, I mean that that refinance process was six months. Well, the, the refinance, process... no, I mean uh, when you did the bridge financing for how long? the bridge financing was for six months so the it was a pre-construction project where the the builder actually financed the construction okay. we didn't we we didn't do that part um okay. the builder financed the construction um construction took about a year hmm. and then at that time uh when we took possession that's when we had to come up with financing hmm. um because uh cmhc was really slow at the time we couldn't hmm. get it when before closing so that's why we had to go with the bridge financing and then, yeah, and then six months after that, that's when we got the CMHC loan in place. Yeah, it's great. They said the LTV was 85. It's great, with, with, especially with Edmonton, because, you know, CHMC is about uh, the actual um, uh, checking the rent market, and it's not easy to get high, uh, especially for their actual policy, for the actual value of the rent. It's not easy, but uh, you got a good deal, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they and even though actually the price value was even higher than that. Um, so but we got 85% of the, the purchase price, which was which was and good. lower interest rate too, of course. Yeah, well that one we got a really good rate. Um well, what was that? One, 1. Wow. wow. <laughs> and now we're looking at doing the exact same thing like right now with our eight plus and um the rates are double. I yeah, it's almost it. uh 3.9, I think. Yeah, we're gonna look, we're probably gonna get about three point seven five. That was bad, not bad. But yeah, uh, yeah everything is going up. But uh, to be honest, uh, I want the rate to go up. Uh, the, the the market is crazy, <laughs> especially here in Ontario. I I'm not sure what is the the, the game here in Alberta, but um, this uh, going up like this policy is gonna be better for the business anyway. Like for the interest rate, yeah, maybe it's gonna hurt your business a little bit for cash flowing part. But uh, eventually, this is going to be a better investment, uh, like environmental. Anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it'll kind of, there won't be as much competition. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Um, because with the higher rates, um, it doesn't make sense with a lot of people. Like, so they just. You're not going to be able to hit your target. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be a bit creative. That's why maybe <laughs> you're moving to us. Um, yeah, that's part of the reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, it's part, a lot of it is to just for diversification as well. Like our whole portfolio of like 35 doors is mm. here in Alberta and like in Edmonton area. So um, part of it is wanting to diversify a little bit. Mm. So um, what is your get, get into larger projects as well, which is a little bit harder to do in, in Canada. Yeah, so <laughs> price points. Hundred percent. So what is your target now? Which 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 market in US you're uh, you're targeting now? Like uh, we're, we're focusing on uh, more the southern US. So not like any one particular state, but we're looking at um, kind of more Austin. of the landlord friendly states um, in the Sun Belt. So yeah, oh. Florida, Tennessee, um, even Texas um alabama the north and south carolina so we're looking yeah. in all of those areas atlanta um, and uh, i think is, is a promising atlanta and austin is uh, good markets but is uh, as you mentioned the price the price tag there is also different for the price per unit but uh, the, mm-hmm. the number is working and it's more investor friendly to be honest than canada yeah especially in ontario it's yeah even Alberta is more investor friendly, but I think it's even even more in some of those states. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, and we're looking at more of like the secondary market, so not like those the main cities. Yeah. Um, like you know Miami or, um, it's more like like say in say if it was Florida, like Gainesville or Jacksonville, like the yeah, yeah. um the secondary markets. Yeah. So uh, your business model now is based on. Uh, multifamily i'm not going to say land development because you're doing uh, uh an actual um reconstruction after all of the pre-development and zoning and, and all of the stuff but uh, you mentioned that you're um you're, you're you're going to the u.s market uh what was the challenge for you to invest in u.s yeah well the challenge is that it's a lot of things are different um even though like you know, multifamily in in theory is the same, like you same, you know, principles and the, you know, how you analyze a market, how you uh, underwrite a deal is, is pretty similar, but you are still going to a new market and you need to develop a new team, mm-hmm. um, the whole cross-border stuff you need to figure out. Um, so there's a big challenge when getting started in a new country, right? It's, every, it's pretty new. Um, yeah, you basically need to have some boots on the ground. So that's why I'm not doing it on my own. I'm partnering with other experienced investors who already are investing in the U.S. and um, partnering together to do these larger projects. So that's why I'm kind of doing it and mitigating a lot of my risk um, because I'm. It's it, yeah, I don't want to make all those mistakes by myself. <laughs> I'd rather it's, uh, I think this is coming from the engineering discipline mindset. This is where the engineers probably yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like to mitigate my risk. Yeah, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. So, so I like I do a lot of learning and yeah before just jumping in. So right now, is, uh, one of the issues is as you mentioned, uh, moving between U.S. and Canada is the price per unit. So right now in Edmonton, we're talking about one twenty, I think, per unit, or it's getting much than this. Yeah, it's probably going up now. I think it's about one. 100 a door 110 like but that's for the older product yeah um for my like pre-construction multi-families it's it's supposed to be a 250 a unit yeah yeah um so yeah it's a lot higher uh in the u.s we're looking at stuff at as low as thirty thousand a door yeah 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 in jacksonville yeah it's 30 and forty thousand dollars. like you can yeah. have like uh i'm not sure like a hundred unit with three million dollars yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you can get yeah, the larger projects and um yeah, that you, you just can't you just can't find that here. So reg- re- regarding the mass here. So regarding the mass here, um you mentioned the the actual uh price uh, like uh, with older units with 110 versus a new pre-construction with 250, but the actual mass is not this. Is 110 plus as actual adding value because you have to if you want to add value and make a, an actual profit on the project and raise the noi so what was your mass to decide because i think this was part of your calculation as engineer first of all and and as a, a business uh, 
uh, business owner uh, to do this transition to focus on pre-construction. What was your mm-hmm. mass between the 250 and 110? What was the actual actual number, like 180? How much are you going to spend on the actual unit? Oh, they, the actual cost of the Yeah, the actual cost, like, like, yeah, yeah, like, including adding the value, contractors, and all of the stuff. Because I see that clearly you decided that it's making more sense to do a new unit reconstruction 250 because it's giving, because the price range getting up and up and up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we did it because it was, you know, we're buying a kind of retail prices. Like we're not getting a huge deal on the purchase. Hmm. Um, the attraction is that it's brand new. Um, it's easy to finance. It's easy to attract like really good tenants. Like hmm. it's an A class building in like an A neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and it's a perfect buy and hold, right? We can hold on to that for 40 years and it would be great. Um, and we don't have the risks of, you know, having old electrical, old plumbing, like high insurance costs and yeah. all of that. Yeah. Um, but still, and then it's easy to finance, easy to get the new CMHC MLI select the financing as well um, so that it cash flows. Um, but yeah, when we were not involved in the construction side of it, so um, our price per door was, um, well, for the first six bucks, it was more like 225 a door. Hmm. Um, and it's higher because that's not just the typical apartment style. Like um, half of the units are like 1500 square feet townhouses hmm. okay. um, with that's three big. bedrooms, two and a half baths. Um, it's, it's like a house with a garage and a yard and a deck. Um, so that's why it's much higher. And then there's, and then half the units are one bedroom apartments, which are on ground level. They also have a garage and some outdoor space. Um, all of the, all they have um, their own entrance. So it's, um, it's not your typical apartment building. So it's, that's why it's a little bit of higher, higher cost. But you change the strategy to be in a lower range. You say, you say you're saying that you started with a higher end, but because you didn't, well, you're not part of the actual development part or the construction part did you still on the same boat or you change the strategy now to do more or more involvement on the actual construction side no i'm still not involved on the construction side like we we work kind of closely with the builder we review the drawings and um you know stay on top of them and you know do regular inspections of the property but i'm I'm not acting as the builder or the developer. So what was your, your initial step to able to have this system? Because as you mentioned, as a, on the beginning, you were looking for joint ventures uh, on the uh, on the single family home and then the transition to um, multifamily, uh, putting an actual down payment. So you need to, have, to start this topic, which is raising capital. So what was mm-hmm. your uh, actual step to start do this? Because it's not... It's always hard to get a few comfort zone and start asking people for money. You start doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. It's only the first two properties we bought on our own. And then after that, um, yeah, the rest were with joint venture partners or um, investors. And so I guess when, if you go back to how we started doing that and the systems, um, well, we, I guess we started with people who already like liked and trust us. Um, that's the way to start Um, because if you're or you know talking to people who don't know you and you're also talking them about um, and they also aren't really convinced about real estate like it's a pretty hard um, to get them on board so um, starting off with people that are closest to you that trust you already is a good way to start Um, and so yeah it was like family and friends that first invested with us (laughs) and um, and then after that, we kind of, you know, it was all about just kind of putting ourselves out there, like letting people know what we were doing. Um, I think that's what really helped. Um, and so I started a newsletter. Um, I started being a little bit more active on social media, just letting people know what we do. Um, because it's, it's, it's not going to work if it's just your, the big secret of what you do. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah and then... And I just really try and focus on sharing information and sharing our story. And then people are more like attracted to us and um, more come to us asking if there's opportunities to invest with us. So it's not about asking for money or 
convincing anybody to invest with us. Um, it's um, it's kind of um, showing that there's this opportunity and um, yeah, it's more of people coming to us. And then when I do have um, opportunities, um, I kind of have this, this network of people that um, I know that are interested in, in future deals. So when I do come across something, then I can go back to them and say, okay, well, this is what, um, you know, kind of what we talked about. You said you'd be interested and then um, kind of go from there. So did you have a, did you started already uh, working on the security laws? Like, did you start to like, focus on qualified investors or you're focusing only on the actual uh, joint venture part? At the beginning, they were joint ventures, so we didn't really um, have to worry about the Securities Commission and those rules at that point, because if your joint venture partner is on mortgage and on title, then um, you're not selling securities, you're just buying a property together. Yeah. Um, but with our multifamily, that's when we did have to um, you know, be aware of that a lot more, because mm. we structured it as um, a corporation, and then we sold um, shares in the corporation and then the corporation owns the building. So, when so you're shareholder selling, agreement. Through a shareholder's agreement. Hmm. Yeah. And so when you're selling shares, that's a type of security. So then you have to be um, following the rules. And so, yeah, we do it under the, the private placement exemption, which includes friends and family and business associates and accredited investors. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, this next question will be, uh, that constant uh, flow of uh, stream of deals. So what is your strategy basically for finding deals? Is this an MLS of market deals uh, through an actual uh, relationship with, with uh, commercial relatives? So how you get the flow constant for you, especially that you've been not mm -hmm. long time in the market, I think five years on the multifamily right now. So what was your strategy, especially on the beginning? Because yeah, you're going, you're always going to be on the uh, bottom of the list of uh, as a commercial relatives when you're starting relationship with them. How you yeah. basically con convince them to give you deals? Yeah. Um, well, I guess my where I got these deals from because I've done like a sixplex um, and then an eightplex and then we have two more sixplexes under construction. Um, those were all through one realtor that I already had a relationship with yeah. um, through the residential side. Yeah, okay. um, so I kind of already had a relationship with them. And, and then once I purchased one, then I became kind of known on someone who can actually purchase and actually close on these properties. And mm. so when another one came up, then um, they came to me and said, like, are you ready to do another one? And then, and then the next same thing next with the next one, like, are you ready for another one? Like, yep. <laughs> so that, um, once you kind of do one in a certain kind of strategy, then it's, it's a lot easier to keep going. And so, but yeah, you're right. That initial one is tough. Um, so for me, it was because I had a previous relationship with that realtor. Mm. Um, but I'll tell you, like on the other side, like I, we did, we did, we le were looking at uh, older multifamilies as well. And the way that we found those deals, um, like we didn't end up um, closing on them, but um, that was actually through um, commercial realtors who didn't actually focus on multifamily exclusively. Mm. Um, so ones that deal with, um, you know, other um, commercial, like industrial, mm. um, retail, um, land. So they're commercial realtors, um, but they don't have as big of a buyer's list for the multifamily side. Yeah. So if you can get to know those types of commercial realtors, then when they do come across a multifamily opportunity, then you are higher up on that list, I guess, um, yeah. to hear about it. Good strategy, I think. So yeah. Because the idea. actual commercial is gonna be hard. The actual commercial relatives are not gonna choose you at the beginning because you're at the bottom of the list. But this is really a good note. Like, yeah, I, I like this strategy. Yeah. Again, yeah. engineering mindset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because then there are certain realtors who just focus on multifamily, and you're right, they have a lot of um, lot of buyers that they know that can close, and um, yeah, it's yeah. hard to get on that list. Um, and the other way to do it is to, I guess, to find um, a realtor who would more work with you as a buyer's agent, um, which is a little bit more uncommon in the, in the commercial side. Mm. Um, but um, there are um, a couple that I know that 
um, kind of similar where there are commercial realtors but wanting to get into multifamily a little bit more. And so they don't have the listings, but they're willing to work with you as the buyer's agent. Hmm. So working with someone like that um, and using them to connect with other realtors um, would, would help a lot. That's what I would do if I was uh, looking for older property right now. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that you started to look on, on, on old buildings, but the number was not great. And, but how yeah. you managed to, to control as a relationship with whoever bring you the deal because you keep rejecting the deals. How you manage to do this was, it's not rejecting, it's just you have to, I think it has to be transparent. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you mentioned, you don't want a tire kicker because you want someone to close a deal. So how Mm -hmm. you manage to have this balance for him to understand your point of view so you can get something from him and at the same time, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I guess when we walked away from those deals, it was for like legitimate reasons. Um, it's not just like, oh, we can't get financing because we weren't prepared enough and we didn't have the capital. It was because we did our due diligence and there's some major issues with the property hmm. and the seller was not willing to come down in price. Um, so it just didn't make sense. And the realtor agreed with that. They um, It made sense that we were walking away for that reason. It just, yeah. there was no... We couldn't agree on a price. And so I think, um, yeah, we weren't like just just walking away really for no reason because we weren't prepared. So I think that if you have kind of a legitimate reason why you're walking away, that makes a yeah. difference. And then, and then, but because of that, we walked away from the one deal, then he did bring us another one um, in the same area because he knew that that's where we wanted to buy. And um, yeah, but unfortunately the same thing. And that one, we actually spent three months of due diligence um, and you know, spent money doing the inspections of the roof and the sewer and everything. And, and that's when we found out that, yeah, also big issues with the problem across the property would require a lot of work, a lot of mm-hmm. money to repair. Um, and so we wanted a, you know, a reduction in price because of that and the sellers didn't want to do that. So mm-hmm. again, <laughs> walked away. Um, but yeah, all of that was a really good learning experience. And we realized that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of risks in these older buildings. Mm. Um, you do need to do your proper inspections. Um, and then, yeah, just getting insurance costs are so high, but it's why I, I like think the new build. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a good approach anyway. As you mentioned, you're not wasting the guy's time. You're doing your due diligence. You're checking the NOI. You're doing your underwriting process. And based on this, you're looking for an actual reasonable price based on the NOI because eventually the bank will not f- like finance the deal and you have to come with this money from your own pocket. So yeah, I understand. Uh, but basically what you said, it's uh, valid reasons to go back to the, uh, the commercial realtor to explain why you cannot close the deal. Yeah, yeah, why it just doesn't make sense. And we just gave our price. This is what it would work at. And it was very like you know, backed with information, like with inspection reports and showing like, this is how much it's going to cost to repair and stuff. Mm. And we said, this is our price and the seller didn't want to accept it. So (laughs) do you recall what was the price initially and what was you offered? Um, It's easy to remember like per door. I think the initial, it was like 135 a door that was listed at Mm. and for it to make sense, we needed it to be around 110. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't agree on this. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my next point is, I think, uh, mentorship. Uh, how mentorship and mentors help you on your career so far and real estate? Yeah. Well, I've had, yeah, I guess a lot of mentors, a lot of um, trainers that I've worked with, um, all very valuable because um I like learning about what I'm getting into and not just jumping in. <laughs> it's like two ways to do it, right? You can jump in and make all the mistakes or you can just pay for, for education. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I've had, um, I guess from the very beginning, some of the mentors like Don Campbell was um, very influential mm-hmm. um, for us to get into uh, real estate from the beginning. And then on the multifamily side, um, Pierre Paul Terjean and uh, Marcin Drage have been mm-hmm. um, like just, um, yeah, great mentors, um, teachers, 
both of them, I think, in Alberta, Paul and uh, Marcin, both of them is U.S. and Canada, but both of them is more uh, familiar with uh, Alberta market, I think. Uh, Pierre Paul, yeah, he's, um, his almost full portfolio is in Edmonton. Yeah. Yeah. And Marcin yeah. is, I think, in Calgary? He's based in Calgary, but he has his property all over Canada and the yeah. U.S. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And then I'd say on the as far as kind of inspirational people as well, like um uh Janet LePage is a person who I haven't like worked with personally or closely with, but she's always been kind of an inspiration for me. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's um, you know, just a girl from Vancouver who's mm. now like the second biggest landlord in Phoenix. Mm. And so she's just has like billions of dollars. I didn't, I, I didn't and catch her name, management. sorry. And Janet LePage. No. And so she's no. kind of this uh, female inspiring leader that um, that's really kind of inspired me to kind of get into that multifamily syndication space too. Yeah. Um, to kind of Jeanette show that it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Jeanette Lep- LePage. Okay, I'm going to look for it. <laughs> of course, yeah. after the, the episode. So, yeah, she's uh, the... Um, the head of uh, Western Wealth Capital, which is a, a big uh, group buying properties in the U.S. as well. You said that she's focusing on uh, Phoenix, correct? Yeah, Phoenix. I know they buy in, I think, in, uh, in Texas as well. Oh, okay. So m- I think one of the questions I like to ask uh, um, guests is about books. So what was uh, a book really help you to understand multifamily and what was the latest book grab your attention generally not real estate any any book anyway um well for multifamily i guess i didn't really learn about multifamily through books it was through courses that i took hmm. um but um i know multifamily millions is also is a good book and also um the multifamily syndication book by joe fairless yeah um yeah. is a really good book too um as far as any book oh um lately especially what was uh lately uh i would say the um who not how has been a really good book um that really helped me kind of change the mindset that i don't have to go at this alone and um and that yeah you could really go a lot further when you partner with people when you hire people when you build that team um that you can kind of go go a long ways and you don't have to learn how to do everything yourself. And I think that's a, for me as an engineer, that's like a big shift, right? For engineers, you want to learn how to do everything. Like yeah. that's what we do. Um, yeah. But it's not so much about that. It's about who you know and what they know. <laughs> uh, my final question will be how people can follow your success I think on social that's media. Yeah, best way to follow me probably on Instagram um, and on Facebook, but Instagram is um, Bree Properties, so B-R-E-I Properties. Um, and also, if there's, you go on my website, um, Bree.ca, you can also sign up for my email newsletter. And there, um, so I have a monthly newsletter that I share kind of what we're doing. And sometimes I share things on there that I don't share on social media. So if you want to know a little bit more about the stuff that we're doing and like different opportunities, um, then that's a good way to follow us as well. Thanks a lot uh, for being with us today. And we really appreciate uh, having the time. And I hope that we can uh, bring you in again to the show. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It was fun.